I think it's a rather interesting lesson. This lesson, I was kind of putting it together with uh, Brother Jeff and Brother Todd in our morning classes. We were putting it, it was coming along really well. And then the other day I was in prison and I was teaching it to this young person. And I thought, this is a really good lesson for somebody who finds himself in a very difficult place, in a very difficult sin, right? And I think the, the recommendations from this sermon are really uh, very help, helpful for you and uh, helpful for anybody that you can share it with. Because I, I, I have in my notes here, how do you come from tragic sin? We all sin, but sometimes there's this tragic sin. And tragic sin is a sin that causes extreme distress or sorrow. It's kind of like one of those sins that you just don't feel that God is ever going to forgive you. Uh, it's, it's almost like in 1 John 5, uh, 5, 15 to 17, is it? No, 16 to 17. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask God, he, he shall ask and God will for him give life to those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say he should make requests for that. So, there are sins out there. People say it's all sins the same. All sins is all sin is the same if you're not in the body of Christ. Sin will destroy, right? If you don't get your sins washed, you're lost. But once you're in the body of Christ, now sin's different, right? There are levels of sin. There is the sin that can lead to death, get you to fall away from the body of Christ. Revelation 21, 7 and 8 kind of gives a list of the sins which God is going to judge the church based upon, not the world. Because if the world doesn't have the Holy Spirit inside of them, then the world is, well, they're lost. If you haven't been washed in the blood to receive the Holy Spirit, the angels come, they take you away. That's it. But if you do have the Holy Spirit, you still need to be judged. When you die, you still need to be judged based on faith, hope, and love. But here's that list. He who overcomes will inherit these things. I'll be his God. He will be my son. But for the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, immoral persons, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with brimstone. So he's talking about the church right there. Because you can have those sins deep down inside of yourself. You can put on, you know, airs and pretend who you think you are. But God can see who you are. So what do you do when you find yourself in such distress that you've got sin and you've got to get rid of it and you've got to recover from this? Well, Jesus teaches Peter how to accomplish this. And where I'm turning to is in Luke chapter 22, 31 to 32. And it, it's really interesting, uh, this in Luke. And we were looking at that this text uh, in, in an early morning study where Jesus says to him, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. Satan needs permission to do anything down here. When Jesus ascended on high, Satan got thrown out of heaven. Satan can't do anything down here because he can't enter into the throne room ever again. So he, he, he doesn't get permission from God, but this is prior to Jesus ascending. But I have prayed for you, says Jesus, that your faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brethren, strengthen your brothers. That's what you need to do. So that's the encouragement. And I know you're going to mess up. And he tells Simon, well, what will Simon say to him? Lord, you know, with you, I am ready to go both to prison and to death. And he says, I say to you, Peter. Now, it's kind of interesting. He's saying, Simon, Simon, in, in verse 31, right? He's saying, are you listening? But now he says, I, I say to you, Peter, because you got rocks in your ears, you don't listen. The rooster will not crow today until you have denied me three times that you know me, right? That's the sin that, that gave Peter such remorse, that sin right there. As a matter of fact, what is it? Verse uh, 62, after Peter denied Jesus three times, what does he do? Where am, where am I looking here? He went out and wept bitterly. Chapter 22, verse 62. 
because Jesus told him. But now, how do you deal with that? Because Satan's got the permission to sift you. Satan is not the one that caused Peter to deny him three times. But this is how I kind of see how this works with, with Peter and Satan. I think Satan now is, is getting on Peter's case because Peter doesn't get forgiveness, right? Not at this present time, because now Jesus is off to be crucified. And Peter doesn't see him until after the resurrection, right? And we don't start talking about forgiveness of sins, baptism for forgiveness of sins, until another 50 days later. So Peter's got to deal with this sin that he's got deep down inside of himself, right? And Satan's going to use it on him. Like, you know, you're such a useless lowlife. And, and that's the first lesson here. And the first lesson is you've got to stay in fellowship. You can't leave the body of Christ. You leave the body of Christ, you're out in the cold. You're like a, an ember in a fire if you sit around a campfire and it pops and it, and, it's, and it sits there, you know, in the dirt or in the grass and you just sit there and you watch it, you know, and some people will jump up and stomp on it to put it out. But you know, that ember just slowly but surely burns out and is gone, right? That's what happens if you leave. And that's what Peter does because he's thinking, how useless am I? He told me I was going to deny him three times, and I'm not even strong enough to see that I'm going to deny him three times. Well, I'm out of here. So what do we see on, in, in Luke chapter 24? Well, we see two guys on the road to e e Emmaus, right? Picking up in, in verse thir uh, 13. Two of them were on that very day uh, going to a, vill a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. But then all of a sudden, Jesus shows up and starts walking along with them. Now, why is Jesus coming to two unknown disciples? Well, what I propose, that I totally believe that this other disciple, Cleopas, the other one was Peter. And it was Peter headed too, because Peter's depressed, right? And if you look at the text, it kind of shows that it was Peter, because they he says, you know, what things are you guys talking about? And then down in verse 22, uh, some of the women among us amazed us. When they were at the tomb early in the morning, they didn't find his body. They came saying they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it exactly as the woman had said, but, they, but him they did not see. Now, that statement is referring to John and Peter. Because when the women came to the guys in the upper room, John and Peter did what? They jumped up and they ran to the tomb. Now, that, that's important to understand that they ran to the tomb. Look at verse 12 backing up. Because when they got to the tomb, Peter got up. Well, here it, in John chapter twenty. Yeah, I think it's in John chapter 20. It records it's Peter and John running to the tomb. Luke's only recording Peter. Doesn't mean it was just one guy. It's just Luke says, Peter. Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping, looking in. He saw the linen wrappings only. He went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. In John, it's they both went in and... Peter first, and then John looked in and he saw the wrappings and he believed. And then they both left and went to their homes, plural. They didn't go to the upper room. They didn't go back to where the guys were. They went to where they were staying, right? The upper room was where, was where they were meeting, but they were scattered through Jerusalem because this was Passover and, and that's how they would do it. But they didn't go back. John went to where he was staying. Peter went to where he was staying. So how in the world does Cleopas know that two of these guys went there, they didn't find the body because they didn't go back to, the, to, the, to the, the apostles. They just went their own separate ways. Now, if you understand that one of these guys is Peter, here comes Cleopas and says, Pete, what are you doing? Well, I'm just depressed down and out. Well, the best thing if you're depressed is what? Go for a walk. Well, let's go to Emmaus. 
Okay, so off they went to Emmaus. But Jesus doesn't want Peter to what? Get out of the fellowship. He wants Peter to stay with the guys. Mark chapter 16, 12 to 24 is, is kind of interesting. Mark 16. Oh, well, okay, that's Matthew. That's why it doesn't make sense. My head's spinning. Mark 16, 12 to 24. After that, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking along their way to the country. They went and reported it to the others, but they did not believe them. So these two guys are walking along. Jesus reveals himself when they sit down and break bread in Luke chapter 24. And they realize it's Christ. And so they said, let's get up and go back and, and, and tell everybody. So they get up and go back and tell everybody. But when they got there, what Mark is recording is, when those two got there, they didn't believe them that they had seen, right? Now that, to me, is very Im important because in, in Luke, jumping back to Luke, and I'm sorry, I'm kind of jumping here, but back to Luke chapter uh, 24, Their eyes were open, verse 31. They recognized Jesus and he vanished from their sight. Were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road? They got up that very hour, returned to Jerusalem, found gathered together the 11 and those who were with them saying, the Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. Now, some people are saying that's the disciples. And so when these two showed up, the disciples said, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. But that's a contradiction if you go to Mark, because when those two guys showed up, these guys didn't believe them. And they're saying they met the risen Lord. Well, what you see me, what you need to see here is that when they got there, Cleopas said, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon, right? But they didn't believe them. And then the Lord appears minutes later in the room and the people, you know, the, Jesus reprimanded them for not believing those that came and said that he was alive. And you have to take into account, and I won't turn there, but 1 Corinthians 15, 15 verse 5, in 1 Corinthians 15, 5, Paul is giving us the gospel that Jesus died, was buried, resurrected, and he appeared to Simon first, then to the 11, the 11 in the upper room. So when did he appear to Simon first? On the road to Emmaus. And then Simon and Cleopas got there and these guys didn't believe. And then when Jesus shows up, he goes, why didn't you believe these guys? So it was Peter on the road to Emmaus because he's down and out and depressed, not listening to Jesus, go encourage the brethren. And so what we see is Jesus wants Peter to remain in the fellowship. Don't be taken off, stay with the gods. Second lesson, shepherd the sheep. Jesus goes back to, or Peter goes back to fishing. Now, this is important in, in Matthew chapter 28, that Jesus appeared to the women first. Now, if you're a good Jewish uh, historian, you are not going to say that because Jewish men see women as secondary people. And so if you're writing a history, you're going to say Jesus appeared to the apostles first. But this is the truth that we're seeing. And Jesus came to the women first. So it is the truth that we got, and it's not somebody making up stories. So in Matthew chapter 28, verse 7, Jesus, no, the, the angels say to the women, go quickly, tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So, so tell the guys, get up into Galilee because that's where they're going to get the chance to meet the Christ, right? And, and then they he repeats it, 
When Jesus comes to the, wo to, to the women who take hold of his feet and worship, verse 9, he says, do not be afraid. Take the word to the brethren and leave for Galilee. There they will see me. Now you go to the Great Commission, verse 17. They finally met him on the mountain. Well, verse 16. The 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain, which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. But yes, it was... They proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain, which Jesus had designated. So what you see is that he does meet them in Jerusalem, in the upper room, not a problem. But he tells them at some time, we don't know when, to go to Galilee and meet me on a specific mountain. Okay? So they leave to get to that specific mountain. But they don't get there. Why not? Peter takes them fishing, John chapter 21. That's what you see in John chapter 21. Peter says to the guys, let's go fishing. We're supposed to be up on a mountaintop. No, no, let's go fishing. And so out they go fishing. Jesus shows up at the beach, yells out at him. Did you catch anything? No, of course not. Well, throw the net on the other side. Sounds familiar? Like when they first met Jesus. So they get this big catch and then Peter doesn't know what in the world's going on. And then John says, I think it's the Lord. So Peter throws himself in, makes his way to the shore, right? And Jesus is there, you know, and he's, he's got to get Peter to understand because Peter still does not understand. Because the lesson here, the second lesson that, that he needs to learn is what? You got to learn to shepherd the sheep. You can't just be saved, Pete. I've got work for you to do. So Jesus feeds them. Then afterwards, he says to Peter, Simon, son of, jo son of Jonah, do you agape me? Yes, Lord, I phileo you. Feed the sheep. Second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape me? Yes, Lord, I phileo you. Tend the lambs. The third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you phileo me? Yes, Lord, you know I phileo you. And he was he was very upset because God, Christ had asked him the third time, do you phileo? Phileo just means, do you like me? So what Jesus is trying to teach Peter is he really doesn't like him. He doesn't love him. He likes him. When you first become a Christian, you don't love Christ. You like to use the word, but you don't. It's, it's the agape. What you do is like him right? So what Jesus is saying is, if you want to learn to love me, feed the sheep, tend the lambs, put it into practice. And the longer you work with the body of Christ, the more you understand what backstabbing is, because the hardest people in the world to love are Christians, because you think perfection coming out of Christians. But the interesting thing that you don't understand is Christians are broken units, we all have our problems, every one of us. We all have our inconsistencies. And you see a Christian that's been inconsistent. You see a Christian that said something about you. You see something has happened and you just can't understand. So you got to run. No, you have to forgive and you have to continue to work with that person because that's how Jesus sees us. And when we start to understand that we're working with broken units and we're all not perfect, then we understand the love that Jesus has for us because when he came for us, he knew we were perfect. And in, in reality, he knows we'll never be perfect, but he still loved us. That's agape. It's a love that you decide to what? I decide to love the brethren. It's a decision. It's not based upon what they do for me. It's about what I need to always do for them. That's agape, right? And that's what Jesus is teaching him. You got to keep feeding the sheep, right? And Peter wasn't understanding that. <clears throat> Third lesson, you've got to eliminate your doubts. And so now, Peter, you see me on the beach. You know what I said, meet me on the mountain, right? 
Okay, so let's give up on the fishing, guys. Let's get up on the mountain and, and meet with Christ. So we can't miss that date. So up to the mountain they go. And when they're up on that mountain, what does it say? They proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had de designated. Matthew doesn't put in that little piece about Peter taking the guys fishing. And there was only six of them. Well, there were seven of the apostles. But now they they must have gathered the other guys. And because now the 11 is up on the mountain. When they saw him, they worshiped him. And there's that wonderful word, but some were doubtful. Who's doubtful? Who wouldn't believe? Well, Peter. Peter had a hard time. Matthew 16. Now I get to go to Matthew 16. 16, uh, it's 21 to 23. <clears throat> From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. What? You're crazy. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. God forbid it, Lord. This will never happen to you. you you've got the, you got the Old Testament all wrong. You don't understand. And Jesus says, get behind me, adversary. I, I don't like using Satan. Get behind me, adversary. Because as soon as you start to disagree with what Jesus is trying to teach, you become an adversary too. He, you don't turn into Satan. You're an adversary, a stumbling block to me. You're not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's interest. Peter's interest was Jesus comes, kill all the Romans, rule the world. I get to be a general. I'm, I'm taking care of myself. I'm happy. That's not what it's about. Jesus had to die. We understand that because we're way down the road, right? But Peter had doubts, right? And you've got to get rid of your doubts. And how do you do that? Well, I think he, he continues on, right? Make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But this is how you get rid of doubts. Teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Teach them to observe all that I commanded you. Everything that I've commanded you, everything that I've taught you up to this point is the truth. That's what? That's the New Testament. The New Testament is the truth. The Old Testament is the truth. The Bible is what? It's the inspired word of God. Believe that. Put your faith in that and watch your doubts disappear. Did Jonah really get swallowed by a big fish? Did the walls of Jericho really come down? Yes, the walls of Jericho really did come down. How? How do you know that? Do you have to go to do an archaeological dig? No, you read it in the book. It's written in the book. Did they come down? Yes. Did Jonah get swallowed by a big fish or whatever sea creature? Absolutely. Did Jesus rise from the dead after three days? Positively, right? Teach them everything. You got to eliminate your doubts, Peter. And those are the three lessons that Jesus teaches to get Peter back on track. So does, does Peter successfully implement this teaching from Christ? Well, when you turn to Acts chapter one, you have to say, yes. Did Peter remain in the fellowship? Because in Acts chapter one, Jesus says, uh, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for what the father has promised. Well, yes, P Peter was there in the upper room with the 11 waiting for whatever it was, the sign that was supposed to show up, which was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And in verse 12, they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olive, which was where they saw the ascension, a Sabbath day journey, and they remained in the city until the day of Pentecost. So Peter understood that, right? And then Peter shepherded the sheep in Acts chapter one, verse 15. At this time, Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren, about 120 in the upper room. Brethren, the scriptures had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested him. Oh, so now Peter is standing with the word of God, and now he is what? He's telling the guys, well, guess what? We've got to get together and we've got to replace Judas. 
So he's shepherding the sheep. He's staying with the fold. He's shepherding the sheep. And then the last one, he got rid of his doubts. And to see him getting rid of his doubts is Acts chapter 2, when you've got the 3,000, there's probably 5,000 people. They're in the temple square, because that's the only place you're going to get this many people, right? After the sound of the rushing wind coming down, and I believe that's where the rushing wind came down. It wasn't just in the upper room. That doesn't make sense, because you couldn't get all those people up there. But it was at the temple mount, and so all the people come swarming, and they're all making fun. Well, some of them, uh, verse 12, continued in amazement and perplexity, saying, what does this mean? Because they're hearing everybody speaking in tongues. Others were mocking. They're full of sweet wine. So you got 5,000 people. Half of them are mocking you. Half of them are just bewildered. And Peter stands up. That's a lot of courage. If you're going to stand up before people, you don't want to have any doubts or you're not going to speak. And Peter says, these men aren't drunk, as you suppose. It's only a third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of through Joel. It shall be in the last days, God says. Because Peter now, getting rid of his doubts, says, this is what Joel says. This is being fulfilled. This is absolute to me. And he's got his confidence back. That's what Peter was doing. He understood. That's how he recovered from what? His tragic sin. A sin that gave him such extreme distress and sorrow that he went out and wept bitterly. But it wasn't just Jesus says you're forgiven or anything like that. It was Peter put it into practice. He stayed in the fellowship, right? He started to shepherd the sheep and he eliminated his deaths because he put full trust in the word of God. So how does that apply to us? How does that apply to you? In order to recover from a tragic sin, one that has created extreme distress and sorrow in your life, and you just go, oh, God can never forgive me of this. Oh, and you start beating yourself up with it, as Peter was doing, why he ran to Emmaus, why he went back to fishing, and why in the presence of Christ, he still had doubts, right? You got to do this. You have to stay in fellowship. You cannot abandon the fellowship. Out there is the cold world. You can't just say, oh, I'm out of here. No. Hebrews, what? 10, 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. He who promises faithful, let us consider one another to, in order to stimulate love and good deeds. Think about each other and it'll stimulate love in your heart to do good deeds. Not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. The day drawing near is the Sunday morning or the Sunday evening when these guys are getting together. The day drawing near is not the judgment day. It's the Sunday when we can come together in the presence of God, whatever time that may be, but encourage people not to be forsaking the assembly you got to stay in the fellowship. It's a fellowship that's going to strengthen you. Second point is, are you shepherding the sheep? And this is where you got to turn to Matthew, because that's what Jesus gets uh, talks about. In Matthew chapter 25, it's the sheep and the goats. But what does he say to the sheep who are being rewarded to be at his right hand? Where is that? Someplace place. Ah, I was hungry. You gave me something to eat. Thirsty. You gave me something to drink. Stranger invited me in. Naked, clothed, sick, visited, in prison. What's he saying? Where am I in my notes? There I am. Hungry and feed me. Did you give somebody the bread of life? Don't be thinking he's talking physical. He isn't. He's talking spiritual. Hungry and fed me. Thirsty. What is that? That's the living water of life, which is where? In you, which is what? Bubbling up. That's what Jesus told the woman at the well. Is the word of God in you bubbling up? Are you, you know, are you like that wine? You just got to get it out there. Oh, wow, look, somebody's thirsty. I can give him something to drink. Do you have something inside of you that you want to share with somebody of the word of God? I was a stranger. Do you practice hospitality? Naked. 
Teach them how to get into Christ. Plan of salvation. Baptism. Sick. The sick part, I think, is Matthew chapter 18. When you see a brother in sin, did you go to him and talk to him about it? In prison. If he doesn't listen to you, now he's in prison. He's in prison with the sin. Take two or three or more. Go visit and convince him that he's lost. He's stuck in prisons. Prison is sin. And people put themselves there because they won't let it go. That's what Jesus is saying, right? Are you shepherding the sheep? And then last one is what? Do you struggle with doubts? Everybody gets doubts. There's nothing wrong with it. But work on them. Wrestle with God. What's he saying in James chapter 1, verse 15? No, that's not verse 15. Verse 5, if you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously without reproach. It will be given to him. He must ask in what? In faith, without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven, tossed here by the wind. That man ought not to expect he will receive anything from the Lord. Don't expect anything. If you don't believe in the word of God, well then, hey, you got no faith. First, uh, second, second uh, Timothy 3.16. Word of God is inspired, profitable for, right? I got to accept the Bible as being profitable for the man of God. If I don't accept the Bible, I'm a doubt doubter. And if I'm a doubter, God can't work with me. And I need to understand that. So what's he, what are we talking about here? We're talking about tragic sin. And it comes in and it'll just destroy you. It'll beat you up. Because just for somebody to say, oh, don't worry about it. God, God forgives you. Yeah, but do I forgive me? And is that it? Just say, okay. No, that's not it. For the tragic sin, when you're so down and out, these are the three things. You got to stay in the fellowship. You cannot walk away. Because that's suicide. You have to learn to feed the sheep when you're working with people. And that doesn't mean teaching. It just means working with brethren. Feed the sheep. Tend the lambs. Tend the sheep. It just means get into discussion. Share. Learn. Grow. Together. Right? Shepherding the sheep. And then the last one, eliminate your doubts. Because doubts will destroy you. Right? And the world is trying to fill us full of doubts about God's word. Don't let them do that to you. Trust in the word of God. If you have doubts, talk to people and, and get rid of them. You do those three things. You'll overcome your tragic sin. Thank you.